Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 199, Singing Alone, The Boogeyman in the Closet. In this return of car thoughts, I will take you through a short explanation of how I conceive of individual singing assessments as part of a holistic choral music curriculum. Toward the end, you will even get a chance to hear, for the first time, some thoughts from my daughter Clara, who just completed the ninth grade version of my class. I ask her to reflect on her pretest back in October all the way to her second semester final in May that she just had done the day before. We will go over the pedagogical and philosophical reasons that I believe that it is our obligation to insist that every individual student deserves individual feedback on their progress. Being allowed to hide in the group causes equity issues, which we'll talk about later in the show. Before we get there, don't forget to support this show because it dies without you. Listen as much as you can. Use the Coralosophy checkout code at graphitepublishing.com, endeavormusicpublishing.com, Sight Reading Factory, and My Music Folders. And if you really find this show useful, I hope you will help me crack over the 200 mark of paid supporters who chip in voluntarily either on Patreon or Substack. Just search Coralosophy on either platform to get signed up and keep this show going into the future. So in this shortish episode, shortish, I will focus on the singing alone part of the number one national standard from NAFME. We will cover the singing in small groups standard in a future episode. Stay tuned. The producers and inner circle at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, Jonah Clicksbull, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, DF, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. Attention event organizers. Ludus is here to take your events to the next level. Imagine a ticketing platform that's not just about tickets. Ludus offers marketing, fundraising, and even volunteer management all in one place. It's time to streamline your event management process and impress your attendees. Join the Ludus family today and unlock endless possibilities for your events. Go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy and try it out now. Free to you. And if you use that link, you'll get the marketing feature free to your customers as well. The first national standard in the U.S. for music education is singing alone and in, and in small groups a varied repertoire of music. Um, I strongly believe that that is the best thing that NAFME has on their website. I might be biased as a choir teacher, but I don't think it's really just bias as a choir teacher. I actually believe that future instrumentalists also would benefit from a music curriculum that puts as its first priority singing alone and in small groups. Because of the development, as we've talked about a lot on this show, about the development of the inner ear and the inner brain that singer ha- singers have to do. Yes, it does happen with instrumentalists as well, but it has to happen prior to the singing for singers because singers are the closest to language. So I'm not going to go too far uh, into that now, but what I want to talk about is how do we implement this idea of singing alone and in small groups in our ensemble classes that oftentimes are large, right? Even if they're music Uh, general music classes, they oftentimes have lots of kids in them, and singing by yourself is scary. So there is a a way of thinking about this that I think is really, really important to hash out. So as many of you know, if you listen regularly, I do believe very strongly that every kid who takes a choir class should be, as part of the class, required to sing alone. Okay? Um, some people will really be off put by that because again, why sing Because singing alone is scary. I just got done with, uh, the last individual sight singing or, um, really music literacy assessment is the best way for me to think about that. I don't really want to call them sight reading assessments anymore. Um, because, partly because of the way that I deliver the exam, which I will talk about here in just a second. Uh, it is, it's really a music literacy test, but every single kid has to do it. And we have 20, 220 kids in our program ish that are on in an ensemble vocal music class. And that, that little bit of singing alone for our kids is three ish times a year where they're in front of a teacher individually singing by themselves. We are able to evaluate things about the way they conceive of the music that they're learning to read and learning to then, because of course their ability to hear it in their head uh, is being demonstrated by whether or not they're able to read it with no 
aural support. So without that, uh, without that, that opportunity to hear themselves individually, and for us as the teachers to hear them individually, it really just is guesswork whether or not they are learning and progressing. And I know that we think that we are being compassionate by saying that in my class, you don't have to sing them by yourself if you don't want to. But the problem with that is that teenagers typically, and especially even younger adolescents, preteens, they are not going to say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. That sounds really scary and hard, but I'll opt into that. They won't think they can do it. That's the problem, is if it's part of the class and part of the culture and everyone's doing it, then yes, they will do it. And they will be, they will be scared, some of them. Some of them will be really, really scared. And they will feel very, very nervous, and their voice will shake, and they might even cry. But in my experience, I've been doing this now for almost 10 years, in individual singing, singing tests for everyone, every single person. I don't care how, if you're a beginner or you're advanced, they start from the very beginning, and they're singing by themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've had kids go through that process and thank me for that process because especially in a you know not every high school choir program is the same but in our classes the classes are very large and so sometimes the kid who needs to sing alone by themselves with the teacher and get feedback the most is the kid who is shy because oftentimes if they don't have the opportunity outside of the choir as part of the class to sing for a teacher and get validation and feedback then they never get it because kids oftentimes are, um, oh, and, and giving validation to the group for something that happened in a group is not enough. That's not enough. They, they have to have individual validation, not thank you for being part of this group. Look what we did. Kids really do need good job for what you did. A good job for what you did by yourself. You thought it was really hard. I remember last year when you could barely match pitch, and now you are sight reading um, a level three on sight reading factory, or whatever the progress is. Sometimes it's the progress literally is just you can now sing a scale. Way to go! That's awesome. Do you remember first semester you couldn't even get up and down the scale without my help, and now you're fluently singing a major scale, right? Every kid starts somewhere, uh, but they are also uh, smart enough to know that when they are in the choir, whether or not they are contributing, okay, in the same way that everybody else is. And choirs always have leaders, right? They have the kids who are the bravest, the kids who sing the most fluently, the kids who uh, have a really good ear, so when they, they hear the music once or twice, they know it really well, and then they're off to the races, and they are singing uh, singing better than everybody else, because not because they have better voices in, in their anatomy, it's because they just are braver, because they've got a quicker access uh, cognitively to the music, right? So these, um, these individual tests that we do are, are compassionate. And I would also argue that the individual tests, the individual, regardless of how you set them up, um, are an educator's responsibility. If we are offering a choir in an educational context, I really, I don't know, I have strong opinions about stuff. I, I very strongly believe that it is an imperative to have kids sing alone. That's why, I, it's why it's the number one on the national standards. Sing alone so that the student, they are students, can get feedback for the thing that we're trying to teach them. Because we do, in schools, we teach individual humans. We don't teach groups. We take, teach individual students how to do skills that contribute to the group. So, Again, if we don't give them any opportunity because we're afraid they'll be scared, then they will, one, stay scared forever. They will never rip off that Band-Aid either, and they will never uh, get to the point where they can just start singing in front of someone because they won't know that they can. And if the, and if the class is set up so uh, that, hey, out of compassion, again, teachers do this out of compassion, but if we say, uh, if you want to sing this by yourself, and get my feedback, then you can. But I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to make you. Right? What percentage of kids will do it? Okay? 
That's number one. The, the typical teenager, and it's even more in the last four or five years, read The Anxious Generation, it's getting worse, right? Re I did an episode about it. Go listen to it, but also read the book, The Anxious Generation, Jonathan Haidt, hugely important. Go read it. But in especially in today's day and age, if we give them an option, they're going to opt out in almost all cases. But here's the problem. It's an equity issue. If the kid, if we give them the option, who is going to be the one who takes the option, who raises their hand, who says, yeah, I'll sing by myself and get some feedback. It's the kids who already do it. It's the kids who are already ready to do that. And they're already the brave ones. They're already the ones that are getting the solos. They're already the one that make the, that are making the top choir. They're already the ones who are doing the musicals in the fall or the spring or whenever your school does it. And they're probably the ones that are getting uh, the leads. They're probably the ones that sing solos at their church. They are the kids who need it the least. And they will be the ones who raise their hand. That's the problem with the optional singing by yourself paradigm. Okay. So what we do, and there are episodes about this, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, on uh, quarrelosophy.com slash music literacy. You can find all of the stuff about how uh, I've set up these tests over the years, but, so, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. Episode 69 is a really good one to go back and listen to, where you can actually see some examples of uh, me giving these tests with some brave kids several years ago who volunteered to let me film it. Um, but basically what happens is that they come in in October of their first year in choir. Um, they then are assessed a pretest. It's not for a grade, but it is not optional. They all have to do it. And they come in, uh, I, we pause class and we do other, like listen to TED Talks and you know write, uh, write on worksheets and do other kind of stuff so that I can stop rehearsals because it's worth it. And take, even if it takes three or four days, we pre pre-assess kids. How well are you reading, hearing only the tonic? How well can you re work your way through this exercise right now? Even though, and I tell them, this is not a this is not a test. We are not auditioning for anything. I just need to see where you're starting, so that I can craft a progress plan for you. And that's how we explain it to them. And we talk it to talk to them about. Do you remember in elementary school when you were on level leveled readers? Sight Reading Factory does that we can put you on a level that allows you to figure it out at your current level. And so for some kids, the true, true beginners, which we do have in our program, I've never seen a piece of sheet music before. I have never sung a cappella before. I don't, I don't do anything other than sing along with the radio, whatever it is. True beginners. And even if they have pitch matching struggles, I can use Sight Reading Factory to custom create a starting place for them. Level one could be too hard. And it could be because they can only match pitch in, in a three note range or whatever. So then what we do is we figure out in that October pretest, where is this kid right now? In, in high school, most of them can handle a level one with a little bit of, hey, look over my shoulder and I point at what note you're on. And I told you that th this is do and here's what do sounds like. And if I, you know, kind of use my finger and walk through, most kids can figure it out. But some kids need um, that custom exercise. And maybe it is literally just two pitches on quarter notes and just getting them. So, uh, and then what I would say to that kid is, Hey, good. We found where you're starting by, by December. When we do our first semester final, I want you to be able to sing this custom exercise, this type, this format of custom exercise, keeping a steady beat and staying in tune. That's your goal. And maybe it's three notes. I, I've never started someone on only three notes. I've the, the most or the least I've ever done is uh, on is five notes where we used, um, I'm sorry, four notes, uh, do, re, mi. So the, the first, second, and third scale degree, and then the seventh scale degree down below. So like, so a do, re, mi, ti, do, those four notes so that they can practice going up and down around the tonic but don't have to vocally do much registration shift because that's the source of a lot of the problems too. And, and during that pretest in October, what I'm doing is figuring out where each kid is right now so that we can set a goal for December. Then we do the test in December. We assign uh, ways for them to practice through their Sight Reading Factory memberships, um, which I'm really excited about um, kind of going forward. There's some new tools coming out for Sight Reading Factory. Stay tuned to help make this even easier for teachers to get these assignments out there to kids and have them uh, be easier to, to manage. Um, no spoilers. Now, um, it is uh, that and that 
opportunity to practice is their chance to study for the final, right? So in other classes, we do this. Uh, we give kids stuff that they have to work on, and then they might have to study it in order to get an A. Uh, That's what we do in choir, too, because why choir is a class. Choir is a class just like all the other classes. We're going to try to approach this academically and, and set growth goals for kids. So then they come in in December and they do it again. The way that I evaluate the actual test is that they get a piece of music that's appropriate for their level. And then what, what we do is we allow them to hear the, the tonic. We teach them to sing a scale and arpeggio pattern. There's a lot of ways you could do that, but ours is uh, you know very formulaic. Uh, they go up from do up to so back down to do, they take a breath. Then they sing do down to fa and back up to do and take a breath. Then they sing a arpeggio, do mi so mi do, breath. Do fa la fa do, breath. And then do mi so mi do so do, breath. Okay, And, and the, the, we teach that to them in class um, as their answer key for, the, for these, these evaluations. And then of course we practice these things every day as a group. But as a group, as I talked about earlier, the strong readers will lead and the weaker ones will follow, which is why this individual piece is so crucial. So crucial for the kid who is um, really good because it'll make them even better, but also really crucial for the kid who doesn't feel like they're very good right away. And they never will unless they feel that, unless they're getting that individual validation and having their own appropriate level set for them right? Okay, so I'm getting sidetracked, I'm rambling, but these are unscripted, so here we go, stick with me. So then what we do, they've sung their scale and their arpeggio pattern, we give them 20 seconds to scan the exercise. And 20 seconds, whether they're really good at it, at it or not, it's, they're, it's not enough time. 20 seconds is not enough time to perfect it in their head. It's just a scanning time. And then I say, one, two, ready, and sing. And they start working their way through it. Choralosophy listeners will remember RyanMain.com, but he has recently created EndeavorMusicPublishing.com, which is something different, something bigger, and something better. Endeavor is not a marketplace. It's a traditional publisher with a 21st century business model, which means that they have editing. Each piece is chosen and selected with accessibility in mind. Endeavor supports composers with a majority of the sales going right to the composer. Plus, there are tons of voicings to fit the needs of your program, instant downloads, full recordings, practice materials, and more. So head over to Endeavor Music Publishing com now and check out the catalog. Then, if they are struggling and if they are having trouble, then I might interject a very light redirection pitch. Maybe it's just to re get them right back onto the right pitch and then just let them keep going. Uh, the idea is to let them work as much as they can independently, and also I encourage them to to uh, to stop and fix their own mistakes. In fact, that we tell them that that is the goal. The goal is not that you fly through the exercise perfectly. It is that you catch your mistakes and fix them. Okay, because again, that's what we do in rehearsals. So why teach a skill that we don't actually do in rehearsals? How often, especially at the high school, middle school, elementary school, even college level, do we pass out a piece of choral music that they've never seen? and say, one, two, ready, go. And as soon as a kid makes a mistake, we stop the whole thing and go, oh my God, really? Really? Can you even sing? F. <laughs> right? That would be ridiculous. But yet, we, oftentimes, if we do grade sight reading, and not enough people do do this individual work in the first place, but even if we do, sometimes we will grade based on right notes, wrong, right notes, right rhythms, have them go through it one time just to go real fast, and then grade them based on what they got right and what they got wrong. But of course, that's a very and, and anxiety-inducing and very not realistic way to evaluate music literacy. So what I do is I'm actually looking for them to be able to catch their mistakes because that's a huge, huge rehearsal skill. Um, do you know that you just sang an E instead of a D? Because we're using solfege as our way to hear it in our head, right? For these, again, kids that don't have an instrumental background, they don't know what a D sounds like, they don't know what an E sounds like, they don't know what the difference between that does, it sounds like, but they've memorized Do Re. Okay, so then they start to memorize that and they can make that adjustment. Now, so let's say we're, we're going to go back to the kid who's got that customized exercise, right? Do, Re, Mi, T, and Do. And first, the first semester final comes along, they've, got, they've worked up to that goal, and they're able to get through that very simple exercise, no weird rhythms, just quarter notes up and down, four different notes, and they're able to go all the way through it pretty fluently. 
and 99 times out of 100 they are when, when we make it that easy because we do want to set it's like setting a ladder rungs of a ladder if there if the kid has no skills at all in this exam at first um, i'm going to make the first rung of that ladder as low as i can why because i want them to see an a on their first semester final i want them to see that they can be successful at this i, I want them coming out of that first final going i can read I can read music. Okay. Then we start ratcheting, ratcheting it up. Okay. Next semester, tell that kid, yep, you're reading now. We've got the flow of this. Now we're going to go to those level ones. The level ones might go all the way up to so, and they might even walk down a scale uh, on the other side of the tonic. Right. So this is going to be more notes that you're going to have to pay attention to. And some of the notes might last two beats. So you see, we're adding just a little bit more stuff that they have to think about. Same goals. We're setting goals that by the end of the semester, that for end of the second semester, you're now reading that level one. And so again, that might be uh, the, the, the total beginner beginner uh, at the end of ninth grade, reading through a stepwise quarter note, half note pattern with nothing. They get no help other than the, <laughs> they get no help other than the tonic. Okay. But again, they finish their first year of choir, and then they're also taking those skills, looking into the sheet music that we do, which is way more complicated, in class, and they're looking for those patterns now that they can recognize. And will they still be learning some by ear, by hearing the stronger singers around them in the choir rehearsal? Absolutely. But then what are they doing? They're, they're building their own audio library in their head to help their individual progress as well. So it's uh, this is this is how this this is why this works so well, and they're also building confidence though, to where they're taking some of this individual work into their choir rehearsal and vice versa, where they're able to say, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're sure there are be kids in here that are better at this than me, but I I can do this too. That's so powerful for, as a motivator. Okay, so this has been the really fun part for me is to see this this progress go. Like we've just gotten better over the years at delivering these exams. I encourage you to, uh, to go back and listen to episode 69, where, where I go more into detail about how we set up the test and especially how I grade it. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. Basically we do it out of 50 points, all the notes and rhythms that the, that the kid gets at their level correctly, that's 50 points, but I actually don't take off points. If they make mistakes, I take off points. If they don't catch the mistake and I have to help them fix it. If I have to help them find it or fix it or redirect them to the right pitch, clap out the rhythm for them, whatever it is, then I then I take little points off. Okay, um, so I give us some examples in episode sixty nine of how that might translate into an A in my system. Uh, like you know what, how much help would still be A level work in our in our system. Uh, so the idea again being that we want them to do as much as they can on their own, then as far as moving the kid up to the next level, what we're looking for really is fluency. They're doing it with uh, like 100% without my help. And they're able to get to all the right answers or all the right stuff without my help. When they're doing that with minimal stopping to think, then they're ready to crank up to the next level. Okay, so I will say on, if you're not a Sight Reading Factory user or even if you don't use it in this way, um, is the levels one through four are really kind of sequential and they, they bump up just a little bit. Level five to six is a lot more of a jump. Hi, Clara. Hi. I have a question for you. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about the individual sight reading tests that we do at Lee Summit High School that every kid has to do where they come in in October and as of their freshman year and they sing a sight reading exercise from Sight Reading Factory from, for me by themselves, right? And what we try to do at that thing back in October is we try to figure out where each kid is starting, like what is their, it's kind of like a pretest, right? Where we see how good of a music reader you are right now so that we can set goals. Do you remember having to do that for me in October? Mm-hmm. Do you remember how scared you were? Yeah. Talk about that. Well, uh, um, I wouldn't say scared is the right word. I would say more, for me, it was more like nerve wracking. Cause one, you're my dad. Two, you're my teacher. And like, I just, 
don't like singing in front of those two combinations of <laughs> Okay. All right. So the, so I had two things working against me. One I was your teacher and one I was your dad. Basically, yeah. Okay. So you uh, and I kind of I remember I kind of had to make you do it because you were um kind of throwing a little little fit of nerves at the beginning, but then we got through it and you did fine. I think I remember we did a level a sight reading factory level 2 and I had to I had to kind of guide you and help you nudge you along when you would stop and get nervous. You had done you had done sight reading level uh, factory level 2s before, but never at school like in a in kind of an evaluation type of a situation. So I think you were really nervous. Do you remember that? Yeah. And talk to me about how that's different for you now after the school year is ending. Uh, you just came in uh, and did your second semester test. You did a level three. And if I remember correctly, I gave you, I think I gave you a 47 out of 50 on the, on the test uh, because I had to step in and help you a couple times on those level threes, which are harder. Uh, but I only had to help you on rhythm to try to make sure that you were keeping a steady beat. Uh, other than that, I didn't help you at all. Did that feel uh, less scary? Mm-hmm. Because over the years, like, you kind of realize, oh, it's like a normal thing to be embarrassed. Everyone's embarrassed when they first sing in front of their teacher. And then, like, you wait a little bit and, you, and you're kind of like, you know what? I don't really care. Let's just get this over with, <laughs> or something. Yeah, you just you just don't think about all that, and you kind of just do it. So part of it just means that it just gets normal. It yeah. becomes normal. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, what about the feeling of accomplishing something when you when you realize that you actually just did a better job reading the music, even when it got harder than you did when on easier music at the beginning of the year? Doesn't that make you feel good? Yeah, it kind of makes you feel like, oh my God, I just did something that I worked for. Right, so so you felt like you had um, overcome something challenging and something hard and you did a good job anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. What's What are your sight reading goals for 10th grade? Probably just like learning how to read the notes without having to put in a soulfish. Oh, you mean you mean without having to write it into your choir music? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. And so, yes, that, that would be a good goal. But as far as your individual music literacy tests that we do, uh, do you have any goals for next year? Do it faster than I did and like stop second guessing myself. Ah, do you remember the do you remember the vocab word that we use in class for how do you, what you call that when you do it faster without having to stop and think? We have a word for it and it starts with an F. We do? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Good thing we're not in class right now. You'd be in trouble. It starts with an F and ends in luency. Oh, fluency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. Yeah, so your goal next semester is to work towards fluency on your level three, which you're very close to already with the exception of those couple of eighth note rhythms that you didn't want to go fast enough to do. Uh, so I think you'll get there, and I think you might even get into level fours next semester, or next year. What do you think about that? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Clara. Thank you all for listening to this episode. As always, the way that we keep Coralosophy moving into the future, we just hit five years, and the way we hit five more years and continue to grow and expand the way that this platform can be valuable to you, the listener, and can continue to be valuable to the music education landscape is you being involved. The ways that you can be involved, of course, are entering the Coralosophy promo code at all the websites that allow that. They are amazing partners that have been with us mostly since the beginning. That's sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, that is also endeavorpublishing.com, and graphitepublishing.com. You can also, of course, go over to Ludus and check out their products. You can do the things directly for the show that help, like go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and chip in three bucks a month. And if you can't do any of those things, I just want you to join the conversation. So head on over to the Coralosophers Facebook page, like, share, leave comments anywhere that you're able to see the content. Those help other people see the content and join the conversation as well. We are building a movement here and we want you to be a part of it. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.